Welcome to the Everyday Hotel. You'll be on the second floor and your other room will be on the 14th. Wait, we asked for connecting rooms? These are 12 floors apart. We tried, ma'am, but technically they're only 11 floors apart. We don't have a 13th floor. <laughs> we can't be 11 floors away from our kids. I don't see a problem. Stuart! When you want separate rooms, but not that separate, it matters where you stay. Only Hilton offers confirmed connecting rooms at the time of booking. Hilton, for the stay. I'm Major Selba, and this little journey of words is brought to you by me and Booking.com, but mostly by me. Now, imagine you're on vacation, you and your favorite peoples. Beachside bungalows, perfect weather, the smell of barbecue, barbecuing on the grill. Eh, you know the smell. Whatever your vibe is, it's probably just an easy click away. Because with over 28 million places, chances are we've got the perfect place for your next trip. Come on, you know you need it. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. Martyrs and Missionaries is a production of Revive Studios. You're listening to Martyrs and Missionaries. I'm Elise, and in every episode, I'll bring you a new martyr and or missionary, the called and the brave. In this episode, we are rounding out part three of our exploration of the life of Henry M. Stanley. When we last left Stanley, he was still reeling from the death of Livingston, and he was determined to take up his cross, as it were, and carry on the legacy of Livingston, opening up Africa and spreading Christianity. He was actually at the funeral of Livingston, and he was the uh, pallbearer of honor, if that's the proper term, but he was basically like the foremost pallbearer. And he also gave a eulogy, which I was unable to find. It's written in a newspaper that is now uh, no longer in publication. I'm sure it's out there somewhere in one of these archives that I don't have access to, but I'm sure it was very good. And I lament that we are not able to read it on this show. Shortly after this, the Daily Telegraph and the New York Herald joined forces together to fund Stanley on an expedition to explore Central Africa. Central Africa, primarily the Congo, was entirely unexplored. Nobody had a clue what was going on in there, and nobody really wanted to because it was cannibal territory, and that's someplace you just don't want to venture. What's the point? Why would you do it? Well, if you are the Daily Telegraph, if you're the New York Herald, if you are Stanley, there is so much knowledge to be gained and so much journalistic potential from becoming the first person or the first publication that sends somebody out there because the New York Herald made tons of money off of the found of the finding of Livingston. And so they were thinking, well, how can we recreate this success? Everyone's excited about Africa and they're curious about it. So this is the next logical step is sending Stanley, the same famous guy, to the Congo to see what's there. Stanley's mission was a little bit more broad than this. He says, his mission was to complete the work left unfinished by the lamentable death of Dr. Livingston, to solve, if possible, the remaining problems of the geography of Central Africa, and to investigate and report upon the haunts of the slave traders. So three things. One, to complete the work of Livingston. Two, to explore Central Africa. And three, to end the slave trade. On August 15, 1874, Stanley and three volunteers set sail from England to Zanzibar, and he went with men who had either previously served him or whom had served Livingston. And this is kind of twofold. That's because there aren't a lot of men who have extensive knowledge and successful knowledge of exploration in Africa, and there aren't as many trustworthy people to go, and so you kind of don't have a lot of options. So these aren't necessarily going to be your first choice for anywhere but Africa, because as you know, Livingston got deserted a lot, and Stanley also got deserted a lot. So you were kind of left with not the cream of the crop. All in all, after about two months, he had collected 356 carriers and soldiers, and they set sail for Bagamoyo on the coast of East Africa. And when they were first heading out, they actually weren't going to explore the Congo River just yet. They were actually going to explore Lake Victoria and a few other river systems first. But pretty much 
As soon as they got going, you already know what's going to happen. The men began stealing from them and began assaulting the locals, and they kidnapped women whom Stanley was forced to set free, um, and he faced down a mutiny, and then they had desertions and areas of severe famine. Their guides deserted, and the new guides got them lost. So this is par for the course, apparently, when you're going through Africa is just everything that can go wrong does go wrong. This is only about two months in. All of this stuff happens. Many men died of heat exhaustion and lack of food, sickness, and extortion for food because as you're traveling through, a lot of these tribes know that you are dead without them. So they charge exorbitant prices for their food. And if you can't afford it, then you just kind of die. One third of Stanley's expedition either died or deserted. In one battle early on, they were attacked by a local tribe and they lost 21 men in the battle. So if the disease and things like that didn't get you disease, starvation, then a local tribe very well could. So there was danger on all sides. In March of 1875, they made it to Lake Victoria, which is the largest lake in Africa, and Stanley mapped every nook and cranny, and it was 2,000 miles of shoreline. 2,000 miles is incredible, because even now, you drive a car going obviously much faster than a canoe, and 2,000 miles is going to take you a very long time. Now imagine you are meticulously writing things down, jotting down every single interesting thing about this lake, and it's going to take you a very, very, very long time. While he was mapping it out, these different tribes would gather on the riverbank, and they would scream their intentions to kill him, and they would just raise a whole bunch of ruckus, and basically he was so calm and so just determined and stalwart that it kind of staved off their intentions to kill him. He was just kind of an intimidatingly stable guy. As they're exploring Lake Victoria, they come across the lands of King Matisa, who is the king of Uganda, and he was converted to Islam by some Arab traders. But Stanley was determined to change his mind, so he spent 12 days teaching King Matisa the Old and New Testament, and he didn't yet accept Christ, but he said, okay, I'm interested. So he had the Ten Commandments written on a board so that people could study every day which tells you that he's serious. He's not a flippant guy. It wasn't like, you know, these Arab traders came through and then he was like, well, whatever, I'll just, you know, accept Islam or, oh, these people are coming through, I'll accept Christianity. He was very meticulous and thoughtful. And so he wasn't quite ready, but he thought, I'll give this some, so I'll give this some thought. I'll kind of ruminate on it, let my people think about it. Does this hold up? He liked Stanley, he liked his men, and so King Matisa actually lent them some canoes that they could go and continue exploring the western shores of Lake Victoria. This is the part that I absolutely love about the story of King Matisa and Uganda in general. The governor of Sudan sent an officer out to establish some communications with Uganda. And while this officer is there, he meets Stanley. And Stanley sends him off with some letters uh, to send back to the Daily Telegraph. They basically ask the world to send missionaries to Uganda. And this guy, as he's heading back, he does get killed. Um, but in his boots, they find Stanley's letter. And somebody takes them back and telegraphs them all the way to the Daily Telegraph, and money was raised and missionaries were sent to Uganda. And today, Uganda is 84% Christian and 14% Muslim, 2% of that being uh, kind of the more traditional religion. And I have a little bit more on that later, so moving on. Matisse not only sent these canoes with him, but he also sent several of his men. But his men got cold feet when they saw a bunch of half-decomposed bodies. Uh, that were covered in axe wounds, which would give anybody pause. But imagine you have the king of Uganda's men turning back because they don't want to go on with you. That's got to put some pause into, if not Stanley, then at least his entourage, because I'm sure many of them said, no, thank you. I choose life, to which that is a wise response. And one can hardly fault them for that. No one wants to end up as the half-decomposed body covered in axe wounds. Within a few days of being deserted by Matisse's men, they came under heavy assault. Stanley describes it as a scene of rampant wildness and hideous verbosity beyond description, which if you've rattled Stanley, this is quite disturbing. They were surrounded by spears and over 50 bows that were bent double and ready to fly. Uh, they had about 200 men in all that were surrounding them. 
Stanley was forced to use an elephant rifle to sink the war canoes as they pursued Stanley's men to safety. And this is only the beginning. This is not even, I haven't even gotten there yet, guys. So when they completed their circumnavigation of Lake Victoria and they came back to their base camp, more Europeans had died and most of the men were suffering from dysentery. Stanley himself was affected and then he dropped down to 108 pounds. After they recovered, they tried to go on and they realized that several of their canoes were found to be rotten. They lost five canoes, a case of ammunition, 120 pounds of grain, and five guns, which in territory that is dangerous are incredibly precious. King Matissa asks Stanley's men for help in quelling a rebellious tribe, and Stanley intimidated them into standing down. And as they spent more time together, Matissa and Stanley, uh, Matissa and his entire court converted to Christianity. And you can see God's work in here, because when they first come to King Matissa, he's interested in Christianity, but he's not yet ready to commit. But he takes time, he studies it, he learns it, and then he has another opportunity um, to basically call Stanley to himself. Stanley helps him out, and they are able to spend more time together just talking about important things. And at the end of it all, King Matissa accepts Christ, thus opening up Uganda to the gospel on a much broader scale. Matissa also sends 2,000 warriors to escort Stanley's expedition to Lake Edward. So he finished Lake Victoria. He was on to Lake Edward. After that, he maps out Lake Taganika, proving it to be the largest freshwater lake in the world. Now this, in and of itself, these are incredible discoveries and geographic explorations that would put you on the map. But Stanley wasn't done. So why didn't he stop? The same thing that fascinated Livingston fascinated Stanley. The Lua Laba River. Where did it empty out? Was it part of the Niger? Was it part of the Congo or Nile rivers? No explorer had ever tried to find out. And there's a really good reason for that. As tempting as it would be to know that, it was cannibal territory. However, after his three previous journeys, he needed more boats and men. And that led him to a man named Tipu Tip who is a slave trader, a notoriously complicated man. I I looked him up and I, on one hand, he is a bad guy. On the other hand, both Livingston and Stanley relied on him at different points of their journey because he was a trustworthy guide. He is a slave trader, so he is a bad guy. On the other hand, he has the men, he has the reinforcements, he has the name that you need, kind of that, that clout. Stanley's remaining men were threatening to mutiny without the reinforcements, so he really didn't have much of a choice. Uh, so on November of 1876, Stanley, Tipu Tip, and their men step into the heart of darkness, and they are heading an expedition of nearly a thousand men. They spent the first seven days hacking through a dense jungle, and they were only able to cover 40 miles. The jungle was so thick that it obscured the sun. Uh, Luckily, they did have a little bit of of providence on their side because the dry season begins in November. The Congo River Basin, it just gets tons and tons of rain. And obviously, that precipitation, when it rises, it just creates this nasty, muggy, humid, uh, horrible environment, and it brings the mosquitoes and things like that. So what, a little bit of good, a little bit on the bright side here, it's the dry season, so it is better than it normally would be. When they finally reached the Lualaba River, um, they were just beginning their journey. This is, this is the very beginning. And Stanley decided to go by river, and Tipu Tip and his men went by land. And that's Maybe for two reasons, because you have reinforcements on land, you have uh, reinforcements on the sea. So if something happens by land or sea, you have men who are able to help out. But on a more practical level, a lot of Tipu Tips men did not want to be on the sea. They didn't trust it. They couldn't swim. It wasn't their preferred mode of transportation. So it it was good in, in two different ways. Now, as they were sailing and walking by, they came across all of these eerie villages that were empty, completely empty of people. But along the kind of walkways, I guess, of these villages, they were lined with these skulls and bones and just different rib cages and things like that. They just lent a very eerie, ghostly, what's going to happen, like, where are we going kind of vibe. 
As they started down the river, they were blocked at one of the tributaries that empties into the Congo River, and they were pelted with these spears and arrows and these poisoned arrows, and they ended up contracting smallpox. Um, Smallpox killed uh, several of their men, and they realized that as they were kind of going through burying their men, that the cannibals were coming behind them and digging up their dead and eating them. So they began burying their men at sea. But uh, just imagine that, that you have lost maybe a friend, right, to smallpox, and you're already in cannibal territory, so that's just terrifying as it is. And you've buried your good friend, and then you watch cannibals dig up their decomposing bodies to eat them that would just do something to you physically and spiritually and they were they were just getting started journeying forward they approached a series of rapids one of these rapids overturned their canoes and they lost four rifles and tibutib and his men pleaded with stanley to go back and he said sure you're right i should just put this whole thing behind me no (laughs) he said no i'm not gonna turn back this is I'm going to do this. And this is a little bit of Stanley just being incredibly stubborn and also blissfully having no idea of what lay ahead of him. But Tibu Tip knew what was going to happen. I mean, he could, you could kind of tell this is not going to get better. It's going to get a whole lot worse. And Stanley said, no, we're doing this thing. About a month in, they had these sustained attacks, these different tribes that would come at them in this one particular area where there were just multiple tribes that were all working together to attack them. And they would uh, bang on these war drums and they would chant at them and they would fling poisoned arrows at them, which is psychological torture, psychological warfare, and also just physically exhausting. They couldn't sleep for fear of assault. Um, They eventually had to capture a village. They fortified the village and held off 800 men in war canoes. A couple days into this, Stanley has this idea. They need to deprive their attackers of their means of attack, and that would mean taking away their canoes. So in the middle of the night, he liberates 38 canoes. And in the morning, they hear these just cries of rage as they realize that they have have lost their canoes, which are very valuable assets to them because how else are they going to not only attack you, but then, you know, travel. They, They lost all of those, that ability. So Stanley was able to negotiate a peace treaty with them, and he gives them back 15 canoes, and he pays for the others, and he also returns their prisoners. Now, if you hear people talk about Stanley, often one of the things that you'll hear about him, both when he was alive and then also, you know, many years later, they'll say he was a vicious man. He was really rough with, uh, with the natives, and he was just really, really evil. Does this sound like someone who is just a ruthless killer? He held the high ground, as it were, and he still gave them back 15 canoes, and then he paid for the others. So this is very generous of him, and it's it's not the markings of somebody who's a complete monster. Tipu Tib, though, he has had enough. He sees the writing on the wall. It's getting worse. He's not going to do this. He's not going to risk his life for something that to him really isn't that big of a deal. Why would I risk my life for this? I don't care. It's just more and more cannibals. But he does take the wounded and the sick back. And uh, Stanley has 23 canoes. And so he feels pretty confident that his men can continue uh, on their own and manage. And he gives them a rousing speech, which kind of works, kind of doesn't. But it, it gets the job done well enough. For Christmas in 1876, he gives the men a three-day holiday, and they officially christened each of their canoes, and they gave them names like Livingston, Harold, Telegraph, Matisse, etc., etc., even one called Crocodile. All of the expedition is now on the river. There are no more men on the land kind of following along. And so they surged forward, renewed, having this three-day break to kind of get their minds straight and just, just relax for a little while. But as soon as they get going, they hear the war horns. These eager warriors come into view. They are covered in animal skins and paint, and they are screaming two of the scariest words I think one could ever hear. Actually, one of the scariest words. They're just repeating it multiple times. They're just saying, meat, 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 constantly, which would be so unnerving. 
Stanley writes that they felt like ownerless cattle straying among the living. As they battled, he instructed his men to collect shields from every battle they survived and to line them on the sides of their canoes, kind of like a Viking uh, galley, like this, these ancient warships. And, and it worked because these people that they were fighting didn't have guns. So they were just fighting off arrows and spears, and this is the perfect thing to help fight those things off. Eventually, after so many battles, uh, the men just worked together as a well-oiled machine. They'd been together through so many different skirmishes that they were just, they were like a fighting unit. They were no longer just explorers or just kind of like carrying parts of the material. For example, um, in the original expedition, different people had different roles. So carriers just carried the grain, the soldiers fought the battles. But now everyone was equal because they were each rowing the boats. They were each fighting. They were, uh, there was no more division. Um, and so they just worked together really, really well. But right as they had gotten their rhythm, they came across these cataracts, which are um, these this series of like waterfalls and rapids and whirlpools um, that will just kind of suck you in, just rip your boat apart and, and want to take you with it. They were assaulted from both sides. So now they had this, the cataracts here, they had this new cannibal tribe that wanted to eat them. And as they were trying to fight off the cataracts and the uh, cannibals, they heard this rushing sound of a waterfall that was up and coming. And so what do they do? Do they go to land where the cannibals are or do they risk going over the waterfalls? And Stanley decides that they will establish a beachhead and they will fight. And so they fought all through the night and they were victorious but they had just begun this journey through the cataracts. And I feel like I keep saying that they had just begun, but it's true. Every time you think, oh, they're almost done. No, <laughs> not even close. They just keep having these things happening to them. It's just horrible. In this area, there are these seven cataracts that are 60 miles long. And so they had to leave the water and carry all of their equipment and the canoes with them. Um, and, and it took them so long. And so they're, they're not only carrying these canoes and their kit, but they're also fighting off these hostile tribes. So it's just the worst. At one point, they fight for 72 hours straight until they captured the chief and were able to establish a peace treaty. There was just no rest for them whatsoever. And as they're going, they're not entirely defenseless, but they're definitely slowed down. And these cannibals used every possible horrifying technique they could think of to slow them down and try to get them. They would rush at them with these nets. They would actually, uh, along the pathway, they would kind of sharpen these bones and stick them into like your walking path so that as you go past it, it would cut your foot and kind of hobble you so that you would um, be slowed down and they could catch you and eat you. And if they weren't able to catch you, then they ate their own old men and women. So these people were just utterly depraved and they did everything they possibly could to kill you and eat you. So if you're going through this, how do you keep your resolve? How do you just, how do you keep your nerve and not just completely break? And I think a lot of it comes down to having a strong leader. And that was what Stanley was. He wasn't a personable buddy-buddy guy. Um, he was actually very prickly. He was hard to get along with. And, and in fact, people write about him and they say, you know, you could have known him for many years very closely and you will never be a friend of Stanley and it wasn't anything personal it's just he just didn't have friends he wasn't he wasn't a people person um, but he did uh, care about his men in a, in a way that is just different so he, he exuded this calm demeanor for them and he tried to inspire them and just keep everything you know steady headed and he always fought with his men he was always there in the front he wasn't leading from behind and so his men trusted him with their lives um, and that's what made them work if you don't trust the person who's leading you you're going to have a lot less able to withstand what's coming and especially when you're in cannibal territory and there are people non-stop trying to eat you 
At one part in their journey, they come across this village where they found this temple where a large circular roof was supported by 33 tusks of ivory erected over an idol that was four feet high and painted bright red. And this was the focus of worship for a tribe called the Basoko. And there were numerous skulls that were mounted on these poles and a half-eaten human forearm and ribs on the fire. I just imagine seeing this just just so casually. It's not even it's not even hidden. It's just it's just right out there, and just what that would do to you as a person. Searching for just the right job? Whether you are looking for full time, part time, or seasonal work, you can get started today. Amazon Jobs offers the whole package with great pay and flexible shifts that allow you to choose when and how much you work. Find a warehouse close to home and discover the role that works for you. To get your application started for an hourly job, go to Amazon.com slash apply. That's Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. Hi, it's Idris Elba here with Booking.com, and I wrote this poem about summer because I love summer. <clears throat> In summer, we do things to feed the soul. And Booking.com knows just how we roll. We love to swim and fish and barbecue. We love to read and nap and have a few. With cabins, resorts, yurts, and vacation homes, it's such a breeze to book. Where shall we roam? I know it needs some work, but thanks for listening. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. So far in their journey, they have traveled for four months, they've gone 340 miles, they fought 28 battles, lost 79 men, and they are not even halfway there yet. But as they come out of this um, idol, I guess you call it kind of an idol village, um, they come into a territory of people that are um, friendly tribes, they're able to trade with them, but they realize that these new tribes have muskets, which isn't a problem when you're friendly, but it is a problem if you encounter anybody who isn't friendly. Luckily, traveling here was much easier. There were less battles, there was smoother sailing, but up ahead, there were more cataracts. And their largest canoe ended up going over one of these cataracts, and they lost seven men, including his adopted son, Kalulu, who was only 12 years old. He was the uh, the boy who, in part two, I mentioned that he had bought basically off of a slave trader and had adopted him and had actually taken him back to Europe and to America on his tours. And this was quite the blow to Stanley. Uh, he ends up dedicating the falls to Kalulu and calls them appropriately Kalulu Falls. The name is now changed. It's something else. But if you if you put it into Google, um, it will come up with a new name and you can kind of get an idea of where we are at in his journey. And there are a couple place names that I have dropped. And you can also look those up to give a better idea of where he was and where he was traveling because uh, it can kind of get a little bit confusing. OK, I know he's in the Congo somewhere, but where specifically? So that'll help a little bit. These new cataracts were so bad that they only traveled 34 miles in 37 days. And while they're traveling at a snail's pace, there's this uh, tribe that's very friendly, but they're also very superstitious. So one night they barge into the camp and they approach Stanley and they say, hey, we saw you writing in this book. If you don't stop writing in this book, our goats are going to die. You need to burn the books or we will kill you. And Stanley was writing in his exploration journal, and there's no way that he's going to destroy this book if he destroys his journal Everything that he's worked for to this point will be lost. And so he thinks really fast, goes to his trunk, and he finds a book that is uh, very, very similar to the one that uh, is, is his journal. And it's the Shakespeare book. And he takes it and he drops it in the fire. And he says, okay, I'm going to burn it. Sorry about that. And the tribes go away completely happy. And they say, okay, our goats are going to live. And that was that. So it worked out the best it possibly could have, I suppose. They passed the worst of the cataracts and they decided to hop back onto the river, but they weren't quite in the clear and they lost the only remaining Westerner to a whirlpool. And when the men saw this, they lost spirit. They threatened to mutiny 
31 of them actually deserted, but the local chiefs refused to grant them entry to pass through their lands, and so eventually they had to go back to Stanley, and Stanley tries to cheer them up, but he also understands this is a very disheartening journey. You've gone so far, but you feel like you haven't gone very far at all, but you've been there for so long. So many people have died. Think of the things that you've seen, and you can't even escape. You can't even go home because you're not allowed to. This is just a lot to take in as a human. The next month, they were only able to travel for three miles. None of the tribes would trade with them, and so they literally began to starve to death. They only had 116 people, and 40 of those people were seriously ill. But the good news is, they were only a few miles away from Boma, which is a port city near the Atlantic Ocean where there were European settlers. They were so close, but on the other other side of it, they were so far away because they were so weak, they literally could not walk any further. So Stanley sends messengers ahead requesting aid, and two days later he received food and a message of welcome from the Europeans saying, hey, we can't wait to see you when you get here, so hurry up. And he was rallied from this, all of them were rallied by this, and they were able to make the three-day march to Boma. And they were done. They had finished it. They had completed such a very, very, very long journey. If you look once again at Google Maps and you see how very long the Congo is, it's incredibly long. I looked up a bunch of facts about it and and now that I'm recording here with you, I can't remember what they are, but it's just a ton of stuff. It's it's a dangerous river. It's the deepest river, if I'm not mistaken, um, in the world. And that's about all I can remember right now, but it's incredible accomplishment by Stanley and his men. They headed back to Zanzibar and it took them three years. He started out with 359-ish men, only 82 of them returned with him to Zanzibar. Uh, 58 of them were killed by cannibals. 49 were killed by smallpox. Nine were starved to death. 14 drowned. Uh, typhoid fever, crocodiles, and anything else you can imagine got the others. So in that way, it was a bittersweet return. Overall, being a sweet return, they were very happy to be back and to have survived. Nobody before or since has ever accomplished more in terms of exploration in Africa than Henry Morton Stanley. At only 37 years old, he had traveled coast to coast from the Indian to the Atlantic Ocean across the heart of Africa. Now, after Stanley emerges from the Congo River, you can say that he, he might have been like, I never want to go back to that. It was the worst experience of my entire life, and it should be left unexplored and uninhabited by anybody with any kind of, of sense. But no, he said that trade would open up Africa, that trade would uplift her and enable missionaries to come, and you would be able to trade with her and travel safely, not just for Europeans and people from the West, but also for fellow Africans, because it's not safe for them to travel through cannibal territory either. And would you rather live with a railroad or without a railroad? So he had this idea that if you just opened Africa up, that you could improve the way of life and you would also be able to spread the gospel more effectively. When Stanley returns, he is the most famous explorer alive. He is lavished in medals and commentations from numerous countries. Uh, And while he's back, he writes through dark continents. And it is a lengthy tome. It is over a thousand pages long. And I think, I believe you can get it for free. Um, if you just, if you just put it into Amazon, I think it's free or very, very cheap. Um, it's in two volumes. So volume one and two, and he wrote it, uh, within four months of his return. Stanley does try to posit his idea to Britain because Britain is, at this point, one of the the biggest empires in the world. And he thought if anybody was poised to kind of come in and help open up uh, the Congo to trade, that it would be Britain. But Britain said, no, we have no interest in that. We don't want to do that. And nobody else took him up on it either. He was just alone in this philosophy. But in November of 1878, King Leopold II of Belgium requested Stanley to build the Congo Free State. At six months later, he is back at the mouth of the Congo. He has less than a hundred men with him. Five and a half years later, 
His goal was accomplished. He had helped to open up Africa, and he had earned himself the nickname of Bula Matiri, which is Breaker of Rocks. And, and what did he do, you ask? I can hear you asking this. And here's what he did. He negotiated over 400 treaties along the Congo River. He ended the intertribal and Arab slave trade in the Congo. He also spoke fluent Swahili, so he was able to go through and, and just kind of do what a lot of people weren't able to do. He built 1,400 miles of garrison stations. He established peace treaties between tribes that had been in conflict for generations. He built roads and railways, launched five steamers up and down the river, which brought missionaries and trading posts. And it wasn't like he was just sitting around just administrating. Like he wasn't that guy that was just cooped up in an office all day. He was physically going out and breaking the rocks to lay the road for these trains to come. And so his nickname is both metaphorical and actual. Okay, back to the Congo Free State. What is it? What's it about? It was established in 1885, and it lasted until 1908. It was established by Leopold II. It was a private holding. It was not owned by Belgium. It was not owned by any government. It was his own personal property. He used a lot of flowery words, and he was able to convince Stanley that they shared a common vision, that they both wanted the same thing, to bring Christianity to the Congo and to kind of bring her onto the world stage. And Leopold was lying. Leopold had no intention of doing that. His only goal was for exploitation. So Stanley worked very hard to end the slave trade in the area, and he did. But Leopold established a new kind of slave trade. When Leopold established the Congo Free State, he thought to bring in ivory. When he realized that ivory wasn't a particularly, um, it was a valuable resource, but it was difficult to get. But one thing the Congo had lots of was rubber. And so he began to exploit the people of Uganda and the Congo for rubber. And so each village had this uh, quota they were supposed to meet for rubber, and if they didn't get it, their hands were cut off. And so these villages would literally go to war, and they would collect hands as payment for their missed rubber quota. People died of disease, poor living conditions. It was just a completely egregious situation, and the outcry against it, once it was found out, was so huge. Um, now, today, we don't really know how many lives um, were lost during the very brief existence of the Congo Free State, because it can be anywhere from a million to 15 million, which is a very large number, um, but I think we can all agree that it was a tragedy and a horrific um, event in human history. When Stanley found out about what Leopold was doing, he felt so betrayed and upset because Stanley uh, had thought they were in one vision and they were not. And Leopold used these words. And, and this is where Stanley is not good at reading people. Um, he's just, that's not his skill. He is uh, he has a different skill set. And so when, when he heard Leopold say the things that he wanted to hear, he took him at his word and he just didn't think much beyond that um, because his he thought, well, everybody would want to see the slave trade ended. And of course, you would want to bring Christianity to the Congo. He just didn't consider people exploiting it so egregiously. And today we have celebrities that will comment on different atrocities and things like that that happen. Back then, it was novelists, and so Mark Twain wrote a satirical article against Leopold, specifically using this Christian flowery language in order to accomplish his goals in the Congo. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle also had some pretty fierce words to say about him, and eventually, the Belgian government was forced to take and buy the Congo Free State from Leopold at a loss in order to save it from whatever madness and horror that Leopold was imposing upon it. Now, the sad news about this is for a time, and even today, people will conflate the Congo Free State and Stanley and Leopold II. And Stanley had no support for this, um, for this method of doing things for the Congo Free State or for Leopold himself when he found out what was happening. 
And eventually people at his time began to realize that. And so he felt a favor very briefly. But once he was able to kind of explain himself and, and people understood that this was not his intention, he was back into public graces again. There were some people who still held a grudge against him, but also there was also a political shift that was happening at the same time that we, we don't aren't really going to touch on in this show. But there was just a whole bunch of things that are happening behind the, the scenes that Stanley kind of got caught up in and it affected him negatively. Stanley does return back to Africa several times, and a few years after his Congo Free State kind of died down and he's back into public graces, he is asked to accompany a retinue of people in order to rescue Amin Pasha, who is a kind of a politician. He's German. Um, anyway, it, it's a it's a complete disaster. They do rescue him, but it's just it's just very sordid. But one thing that comes out of this is James Jameson, Jameson Whiskey. And he accompanies Stanley on this journey. And while he is there, he just, and it's it's hard to say, was he always an evil person or did something about Africa break him? Because he buys this, this African girl and he sells her to cannibals in order to watch her be eaten. It's just, it's this, this just moment of just total human depravity. And when Stanley hears about it, he is livid. He has ideas for this guy, what he's going to do. But at this point, the guy, Jameson was already sick. And so he did die um, before Stanley was able to met out punishment. But when word of it got back to America and to Europe, uh, the Jameson family obviously is very upset. They think it's slander. They call all sorts of horrible things against Stanley. But it was substantiated. And for many years, uh, Jameson whiskey was called cannibal whiskey. So there's a bit of trivia knowledge for you. Um, but it also a darker side of what happened to people. And, and was he always this way? Is this just what kind of what it would do to you to just wash that day in and day out? Would it just without Christ, would you just snap? Are you capable of doing something just so utterly evil? After this adventure, he writes another book called In Darkest Africa. It's another hefty tome. I don't think Stanley knows anything but hefty tomes. He also visits a missionary named Alexander McKay, who had been in Uganda for 12 years. And he came to Uganda at the behest of Stanley, uh, who wrote in the letter asking for missionaries to be sent. And Stanley said that McKay was the best missionary since Livingston. And perhaps eventually on this show, we will cover Alexander McKay, but not for quite a while. At 49 years old, he's back in Europe, he's in England, he does eventually find love. He finds a woman whose name is a Dorothy Tennant. She is a descendant of Oliver Cromwell, and she convinces him to join Parliament. And he is actually a, a terrible uh, politician. He's, he's just, and I know this is not surprising to anybody, he just was kind of meh in, in Parliament. He didn't really get anything done. But he did write a book, and this book was called Slavery and the Slave Trade in Africa. In 1899, he was knighted by Queen Victoria for all the things that he had accomplished. And then on May 10th of 1909, at the age of 63, he died of a lung infection. And so that ended the life of the man who discovered Livingston, who helped to end the African slave trade, and one of the greatest African explorer, if not the greatest African explorer of all time. And I would say that he is indeed the greatest African explorer of all time. His life is not remembered. And there are several reasons for that. Probably the biggest reason is that he is an issue of controversy because he gets thrown in with the era of colonialism and people think that he's somebody that he's not. Even the man who wrote his comprehensive biography is very negative on him and views everything he does through this kind of ulterior motive lens. And it's quite unfair to Stanley, I believe, because Stanley is not a perfect person. Uh, definitely not. He's not even a guy that you would no most likely get along with, but he is um, a man that God used to do some pretty incredible things, one of which being bring the gospel to Uganda. 
But I think that Stanley knew what his legacy was going to be. And one of the moments he knew this was when he asked to be, mar- to be buried at Westminster Abbey. And the dean at the time denied him and said, no, you're not going to be buried here. This is a place for people who are heroes, people who are good people, not people like you. And if you recall, this is also where Livingston was buried. So this is quite the blow to Stanley. And he writes this in his autobiography. He, he knew what was going to be said about him after he died. But he said, Those to whom I ventured to consign the secret of hopes and interests of my heart invariably betrayed me. I learned by experience that there was no love for me, born so to say fatherless, spurned and disowned by my own mother, beaten almost to death by my teacher and guardian, fed on the bread of bitterness. How was I to believe in love? But I was not sent into the world to be happy, nor to search for happiness. I was sent for a special work. If you remember the three things that Stanley said at the very beginning of this episode, he said he had three things that he wanted to accomplish. He wanted to finish the work left by David Livingston. He wanted to solve the remaining problems of geography in Central Africa, and he wanted to investigate and report upon the haunts of the slave traders. He accomplished all of those things and more. He ended the slave trade. He explored the Congo. He led King Matisa of Uganda to Christ and in turn many more people in Uganda, and he was able to uh, send a bunch of missionaries to Africa that otherwise wouldn't have known, wouldn't have been able to go. So, Stanley is definitely not our normal missionary we do on this show, but he is a uh, he's a very incredible, if unorthodox, man. And even if he has a bunch of flaws, which he does, God used him in, in a very unconventional way to spread the gospel throughout Africa and complete the work of David Livingston. As always, thank you for listening to Martyrs and Missionaries. I'm Elise. Welcome to the Everyday Hotel. You'll be on the second floor, and your other room will be on the 14th. Wait, we asked for connecting rooms? These are 12 floors apart. We tried, ma'am, but technically they're only 11 floors apart. We don't have a 13th floor. (laughs) We can't be 11 floors away from our kids. I don't see a problem. Stuart! When you want separate rooms, but not that separate, it matters where you stay. Only Hilton offers confirmed connecting rooms at the time of booking. Hilton, for the stay. I'm Idris Elba, and this little journey of words is brought to you by me and Booking.com, but mostly by me. Now, imagine you're on vacation, you and your favorite peoples. Beachside bungalows, perfect weather, the smell of barbecue, barbecuing on the grill. Eh, you know the smell. Whatever your vibe is, it's probably just an easy click away. Because with over 28 million places, chances are we've got the perfect place for your next trip. Come on, you know you need it. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking.com. Yeah.